welcome to the Fishing Daily Podcast with me, Oliver McBride. Today I'm joined by representatives from the Low Impact Fishers of Europe, otherwise known as LIFE. And here with me today is Marta Carvel, and she's the new Executive Secretary of LIFE, and Brian O'Reardon, former Executive Secretary and now LIFE's Policy Advisor. Welcome to you both. Welcome, Thanks thank you. Thanks very much, Oliver. Nice to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Marta, this is your first time uh, with us on the podcast and Brian, you've been here before and I hope I got your surname right because I was practicing <laughs> and then when it came into my head, it sort of disappeared. But uh, <laughs> well, Marta, yeah. you've taken over the role as Executive Secretary of Life. Uh, what's the experience been like so far? Well, it's been three months, I think, or four. Um, so it's been quite a, just a few months of adjusting at each other to the new roles and you know, leaving my res all responsibilities and matching the new ones. So it's still a process of change, but so far so good. I mean, we are a small team and we still share much of the workload. <laughs> so it's kind of a change on the driving seat, but so far we are still uh, the same team. So actually pretty good. <laughs> and Marta, what's your background coming into the executive secretary role? Where were you before? Yeah, so my background is in marine biology, um, um, but I've been working with small scale fishers my my whole career actually, 17 years, um, always in kind of uh, NGOs and trying to you know build the the capacity of the fishers to be actors of change in different ways. Um, so kind of feel very honored to be kind of the executive secretary of Life and be involved in this very nice organization. I've I joined LIFE actually in 2015 um, as a Mediterranean coordinator. And this is was my role until December. Very good. And, and Brian, you've taken up the role as policy advisor. How has that changed your role within LIFE from day to day activities? Well, Oliver, I'm much more in a kind of backseat role now. I'm supporting Marta to uh, understand uh, the, the new job that she has. Uh, I should add, I mean, it's it's fantastic working with someone like Marta who has a, you know, a very good grasp of the issues facing the fishery sector and a big commitment to small scale fishers and fishing communities matched by a really in-depth experience of project manager management. So, I mean, Marta knows all about project management, the financial side, the um, monitoring and evaluation side. So I think stepping up to the executive secretary post is really quite a straightforward process for someone like Marta. And you know, my job of helping her ease into the role, I mean, I find myself still uh, making the mistake of, you know, pushing the gear stick into third <laughs> gear or whatever, and then, oh, that's not my job anymore. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, as Marta says, there's more than enough tasks to go around the small team. Um, in the main, my day-to-day -day tasks are very much with, you know, managing what we call our Brussels office. Uh, which Marta is, is is also coming in on, but the the kind of admin tasks, the some of the communication tasks with the um, with with the European institutions, keeping abreast of what's going on, helping to draft uh, reports, newsletters, this kind of stuff. I mean, we we're a team of uh, people with different languages as well. I mean, Marta's obviously. Mm -hmm from Catalonia, Spain. I'm a Brit here in, uh, in, in Brussels, although I'm a Belgian citizen now, and uh, other colleagues uh, have a kind of uh, French background, a Swedish background. So we all kind of support each other in, you know, making sure that our message is being received clearly. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a, a question of, you know, Marta giving the leadership as executive secretary and having a team that is, you know, uh, working together effectively as a team. So, I mean, that's more my role now. I've become a, a team uh, worker and less of a, uh, less of a leader. Yeah, somehow it's a kind of a year of changes in general and not just 
not just in our organization on us particularly, but also I think it's also a transition year in, in Europe in general. So it keeps us in the, this mood of reflection and open open minds into these new scenarios coming up. <laughs> Yeah, there is a, a lot of issues out there at the moment facing um, small scale fishers and we'll be looking at them here today. Life has been calling for the proper implementation of Article 17 of the Common Fisheries Policies. For listeners out there who don't know what that is, what's Article 17 and how could it help small scale fishers if it's properly Im implemented? Well, um, back in I think it was 2009 um, when the green paper process was launched for the reform of the common fishing policy. Uh, there was something there about adopting a differentiated approach to small scale and large scale fisheries. And one of the calls, uh, or I was very lucky um, to have been offered a grant by uh, a big foundation to provide a platform for the small scale fishers to provide a response to this green paper process and this differentiated approach. And one of the things we were calling for was to um, reward those who fish in a more sustainable manner rather than rewarding those who fish more. So basically the way that fishing opportunities are provided, they're provided on the basis of catch history. And the more you've fished in the past means the more you can fish in the present. Whereas the small scale sector are well known for being something like 5% uh, of the European fish catch. So a very, very small proportion of the fish catch and a declining share on, on, on the quota species. So what we were calling for was to have uh, to have a set of criteria, um, objective and transparent criteria of an environmental, social and economic nature that could be used to allocate quota, um, particularly to small scale fishing, to reserve quota for the small scale fishing sector based on these criteria, but also to be able to provide some kind of incentives for um, people to fish in a more sustainable manner. So once you've allocated the quota for the main uh, fishing operations to keep some in reserve, that you can say top up the quota of uh, fishing operations that are using more selective fishing gear, that are um, using less fuel, um, that are innovating in ways in, in the marketplace, which require a bit more investment or a bit more quota. So to use these criteria in, in, in a creative way to incentivize fishing in a more sustainable manner. That in a nutshell is Article 17, but it's hidden away there in the common fishing policy next to Article 16, and Article 16 is all about fishing opportunities and how they can be allocated. And then underneath is a more or less a footnote to that, you've got Article 17. And of course, you know, the big um, get out clause in Article 17 is using uh, catch history to allocate uh, fishing opportunities. But that's still what's happening. So the opportunity to use Article 17 really hasn't been taken at all in the last 10 years. And who's it up to to implement this? Is this down to the uh, Oceans and Fisheries Commissioner? I mean, it's it's up to, I mean, the, the Commission puts forward a proposal on fishing opportunities in any given year that's uh, discussed within the Council of Ministers and a compromise is reached and the fishing opportunities are then allocated to member states based on the principles of uh, the, um, the, the 1984 CFP, the, um, the relative stability uh, that it, we all know and, <laughs> and love so much, which is obviously completely out of date. But member states, um, it's the sovereign rights of member states to allocate the quota in the way they see fit. But they have to inform the commission of how they're allocating quota 
and what system they're using to allocate that quota so that quota allocation and fishing opportunity allocation can be done in an objective and transparent manner. This objective and transparent issue is, is absolutely crucial and it, the commissioner has a role to ensure that member states are reporting properly. So if you like, it should be a partnership between the member states who have the sovereign rights and the commissioner who is the guardian of the treaty um, to make sure that uh, the treaty, in this case, the CFP, is being implemented in the way it's supposed to be implemented. Out there on, on, on the ground, are things improving for low impact fishers, small scale fishers? You know, are, are governments making this effort to 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 provide properly for them? So I would say that like the trends that we see is the same as the last 10 years. Actually, we see like there's lack of fishing resources a lot. There's a bit um, there's this lack. Um, there's unfair access to fishing resources and even to fishing grounds, unfair access to markets. Um, we call also the unfair subsidies. And somehow this lack of proper governance schemes, we are calling somehow for improved, more participatory um, management schemes to to do that. And all all these is kind of turning into a lack of generational relief, relief as well of the sector. We have less and less young people that want to become fishermen, so we have a lack of generational renewal. So somehow the, the situation is quite hard everywhere, um, but that's not to say that despite this scenario, we also see many small scale fishing communities and many of our members, for example, they are getting organized, they are trying to change things in their territories, they are being actors of change and in some places they do different techniques, not in some places they kind of promote changes in the commercialization system to promote more direct and community supported schemes to able to be able to have a fair price of their products. In other, they are more uh, focused on uh, create marine protected areas or management co-management schemes to be able to restore the the stocks and so on and so forth. So I think that despite the hardness of the situation, the sector is trying hard to to move way forward. <laughs> We're looking at a lot of new things coming in here that's going to affect uh, the ability for small scale fishers to be able to make to make a living. <clears throat> We're talking about um, marine protected areas, 30% of EU waters has to be under marine protected areas by a certain date. And then there's also talking about highly protected marine areas, which will have no fishing at all in them. Um, for for your members, what sort of impact will, would that have? So I think the cons there's concern, but I think the concern that it, there is, is not on the what, but in the how. So how this 30% or 10% highly protected is going to be decided and what is the role of the small scale fishers going to really play, no? Actually, many of our members and small scale fishers that we collaborate with and so on, they are asking actually to promote, so asking their, mem their member states to promote uh, marine protected areas and they have kind of a proposal in place, but somehow the member states haven't endorsed those proposals. So it's kind of a nonsense in that direction. Um, sometimes there's arguing that there's no lack of resources and other maybe other things as well. So for us, um, key aspect there is that um, as most officials need to be engaged in this decision taking process and actually if you find a kind of a, a good way to to promote, they could be really allies of those uh, initiatives. Um, um, and you need to uh, as well endorse those initiatives that come from the bottom up approach. Um, embrace as well improve uh, governance schemes such as co-management. For us, co-management is a is a thing that we are calling for uh, for many years now. It's kind of a uh, a good thing that I that we think that could make this uh, change better. Um, where the government with the small scale fishers, scientists and NGOs share the authority on the management of the area. And also we need we call that there needs to be resources uh, on those marine protected areas and so forth to be really properly uh, managed. Because if, if we don't have those resources, for example, there's no 
proper control and so on, then the, as you were saying before, they become paper parts, no? So our um, idea is that um, if you properly endorse um, the fishers to be actors in this area and where they need to decide these uh, protectors to be and so on, they could be good allies. Although if that doesn't happen, um, we will have an, again a uh, fishing sector that that is alienated and com com controversial to those initiatives. Yeah, I mean, I uh, totally agree with, uh, with 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 Marta on that. I mean, these protected areas are both an opportunity um, to engage more with the sector on you know where these areas should go how they should be managed, uh, what are the resources needed to manage them? Because if if you don't have effective control, monitoring control of, of what's going on, effective management, then they just become the paper parks. So we see this whole process of 30 by 30, if it's handled in the right way, it could be a, a game changer. The big worry is the 10%, the highly protected areas, because we know that those are going to be no take zones, no fishing zones. And again, there has to be a proper consultation process in where these uh, highly protected areas are going to be cited. They have to be based on both the scientific uh, knowledge of you know where fish spawn, uh, which are vulnerable habitats and so on, but also the traditional and experiential knowledge of the fishermen. I mean, the fishermen are out there every day fishing. They know what's happening in the sea. They know how things are changing and you know where uh, it would be best suited to have a highly protected area. It has to be done right. As non-quota species are a very important resource for a lot of the small scale fishers. And it's also an important food stock for other fish species. But these stocks are getting hammered by industrial fishing, uh, by very large, powerful fly shooters and other sim similar types of vessels. And we hear from the small scale fishermen, particularly in coastal areas of, of the English Channel, complaining that they come in and sweep up fish, leaving nothing behind. How serious is this for for fishermen and, and small scale sector? Well, it's certainly true, Oliver, that there are less and less fish on the ground. I mean, we hear that particularly this year, that many fishermen, uh, particularly along the French coast and some of the fishermen along the English and the yeah, other kind of the channel fishermen are complaining of less and less fish in the coastal zone. I mean, that could be down to um, climate change. We see changes in uh, fish stocks. We see increasing numbers of cephalopods, squid, cuttlefish, octopus, and these species are notoriously vulnerable also to overfishing. They have very short life cycle. So if uh, you know a large uh, pelagic trawler comes up and sweeps up all the cuttlefish that the small scale inshore sector are trying to develop as a fishery using pots, then you know the coming years, the coming four, five, six years, uh, are going to be extremely difficult for, for the inshore sector. So there has to be some proper understanding of the dynamics that's happening. You know, what role is, is climate change playing? Uh, how are species moving in different areas? There has to be some proper management of the inshore areas. And we would like to see greater restrictions placed on engine power in the inshore sector, the technical measures regulation, which came in in uh, 2016, has some provisions in there for limiting the kilowatt. I think it's 230 uh, horsepower, sorry, 230 kilowatts, which is about just under 300 horsepower that these uh, engines and you know, vessels with these kinds of power should be kept out of the 12 mile zone. Um, so there's, you know, uh, to see how that can be properly implemented, maybe to have some kind of closed season arrangements, particularly we saw recently off uh, Saint-Jean-de-Luz, um, what might be considered 
kind of medium-sized vessel, a, um, uh, an 18 meter per seine vessel with a carrying storage capacity, I think, of 30 tons, encircled a, uh, a shoal of a fish called Mega, which is a highly, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it shoals in large quantities, huge volumes in um, during the spawning season, but it's also a very high value species, which is caught in relatively small quantities by hand liners. So this uh, Persena caught something like 120 tons in its net. And of course, the Mega is immediately dead because it's coming up from depth. Uh, the swim bladder is pushed in, in, into the mouth. The, uh, the net encircles the fish and uh, asphyxiates them. So there was something like, you know, 120 tons of dead fish floating in the water. And the Persena only had the capacity to take on, you know, 30, 30 tons on board. So fortunately, there were a lot of other boats in the area. But of course, you know, 120 tons of fish hitting the market all at the same time brings the price down from something like 20 uh, euros a kilo down to four or five euros a kilo. And if you're a small scale fisher landing, you know, five kilos, 10 kilos, 20 kilos, and suddenly the price goes from 20 down to five, that kills, you know, your... Um, your economy in the marketplace. So these big vessels, I mean, they're not just hitting the resources at sea. They're also, you know, when a large volumes are landed like that, they have a big impact on the economics of the smaller scale sector. So yeah, I mean, we would like to see greater control of, and, and what we've been calling for all along is this differentiated approach. So the differentiated approach means putting funding into um, associations, so small scale fishing associations should be supported in the way that larger scale POs are supported to form their own associations, both in terms of how they go about organizing the way they catch fish, but also in the way they can market their fish. More direct marketing, not being tied to you know, port markets, but being able to uh, sell their fish more creatively, but that demands market expertise. And of course, you know, fishermen are expert in catching fish. They're not necessarily expert in, in marketing it. So they do need, you know, support to do that. Yeah, it's, it's an area where fishermen would need support. At what is like in this country back in the 50s when they set up on board East Uara in order to help fishermen develop markets. It's, it's the same idea would, would need to be done again. Uh, and improved for for people who's because when you're working all the time fishing it's very hard to find find the markets for for your fish yeah um, we see in like in your country uh the bordish gamara the sea fisheries board has been very supportive of the inshore fishing sector they have these uh, national inshore fishing the fishing federation i think it is and the regional fishing federation they now have this new national po and yeah i mean we would like to see similar initiatives in in other countries where the government you know has adopted a differentiated approach and is supporting you know dedicated uh, POs for smaller scale inshore fishing, rather than saying, if you're a small scale fisherman, you've got to join a PO, which includes, you know, uh, multi, uh, 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 multi day boats, uh, fishing with large gear, uh, and, you know, where the interests of the small scale sector who are catching tens of kilos a day simply are, are ignored. They're just, you know, in a, in a different league. And, you know, that needs to be uh, properly seen to. Suppose another area that has been uh, in the news a lot recently and de definitely at the forefront of fishermen's minds has been the offshore wind development. Uh, is this something that's concerning your members? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, the announcement of the energy transition, as also was the blue economy, I think, gives an idea that the, in the years to come, this is going to start increasing exponentially. And I think there's the hurry for it, no? for the Ukraine war um, and the, this context that we have now. So again, the issue is how is going to do, be done, um, whether we 
could understand that this energy transition needs to happen and, or not, but somehow how is this transition going to happen ex exactly now and what is the uh, real engagement of the sector and what are the effects that the, there will be now of these wind developments and so on. The main issue of concern is of course the spatial squeezing because those farms will probably be allocated in those areas where the small school fishers normally are fishing, which is very close to the shore. Um, with a no weather, we, there would be kind of uh, more far away uh, shore um, wind farms, or they're going to be very close. Normally, they are very close, so this is why there's a bit of a concern. So the special squeezing, but also the impact, both in the process of installment, but also in the process of um, of its development and, and how these will affect the fish stocks and so on. So there's kind of a bit of an, an uncertainty of of how this is going to affect. So for us, would be what we would like, like to see is this real engagement in all this process and have a proper dialogue with the technology developers, with the decision makings uh, makers, to see ways to 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 coincide on the marine spatial planning, but also see ways to coexist, no, and test new ways and new technologies that could allow us to 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 work um, and and the fishers to work in in those places. And somehow, what we would really like to see is that the the uh, small scale fishers' contribution into the social fabric, in the food suppliers, and so on, are valued um, in all these processes, and not just kind of seeing part of the problem and ignoring it. No, and so for us, it would be important all this dialogue, not just to find solutions, but also to find a, a common way forward. Yeah, I think this. Uh coexistence that Marta talks about is absolutely crucial because on the one hand, uh, I mean, it's got to come. I mean, we, we have to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, but we know that this green energy is not entirely green and the installation of tidal and wind generation uh, uh, at sea does have an impact on the environment. I mean, we've seen in the case of the North Sea about the um, these kind of plumes of silt uh, which come up uh, uh, because the um, the tidal races and the the currents move differently. There's a kind of venturi effect of the currents moving between the wind generation picking up the silt at the bottom. We also know that there's the vibration of the of, of the wind turbines that the installation of these structures also has a big impact on the seabed. And then there's the whole issue of the, the cables, how that affects the, the fish. So um, that has to be taken into the equation of this, this coexistence. And what we see at the moment is that certain activities are being prioritized. So for instance, aquaculture, and uh, energy generation rather than fishing at generation, fishing and energy generation. Um, and this is one of the issues of concern is the uncertainty of just how the spatial squeezing, the coexistence, the environmental impact of these changes, how that is going to affect the prospects for, for fishing in, in the future. And the rise of, of algae, uh, the rise of seaweeds. We know that seaweed is going to play a, an increasing role in you know, food from the sea. The Commission has also um, uh, highlighted that aquaculture is the way forward for food from the sea, that they see no prospects for growth in the fishing sector. And in a lot of the uh, uh, communications put out, uh, fishing is seen as a follower rather than as a leader in the changes that are going on. So, for instance, in the energy transition, when they're talking of alternative um, propulsion systems, um, it's the marine transport sector which is going to lead the change. And somehow fishing has got to follow. But, um, you know, what we need is an energy transition that is fit for fishing not an energy transition which is somehow bolted on to fishing, because that's simply not going to work. Uh, whatever the transition brings about, fishing in the future has got to be very different to the way that fishing is done today. Um, you know, if sail propulsion is used, that has all kinds of implication for how the gear is handled, stored, 
deployed and so on. And if electric engines are used, I mean, the whole thing about electrics at sea is one thing, but the way that, you know, batteries are stored, that engines are stored, you know, the motive power and so on, where that's put, how it affects the stability of the boat, all of these are issues which, you know, need to be taken into account. So they all point to a very different kind of fishing going on in the future. That's a lot of pressure on on fishermen in order to reach these goals because there's a lot of as you said, talking about there there's a lot of outside influences happening there's the marine protected areas there's highly protected marine areas there's all the spatial squeeze and how 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 does the transition like this take place you know um because it costs a lot of money in order to move things forward and you think that the EU or national governments need to get behind this or do you think that maybe because fishing industry has now become a follower rather than a leader there's going to be no one put from them towards this i think one of the difficulties facing the industry is on the one hand they've um how did uh, uh he put it um you know, somehow the industry has to change from being a kind of uh, secret squirrel, you know, uh, to being, you know, staking their claim. You know, these are our fishing grounds. This is where we fish, you know, uh, being more open and transparent in staking their claim for the future. Because if they boycott the um, consultation processes, if they don't want to reveal you know, where their fishing grounds are, then those fishing grounds are going to be taken over. And I think that if fishermen are going to move from being the secret squirrel to being the, um, the leader in the process, then they have to embrace uh, what is being called as kind of digital transformation, that they have to uh, grab hold of the, this digital technology, the electronic monitoring systems, the log books, even uh, there was a, um, uh, I think it was an article you produced, uh, Oliver, recently about the transmission of data at sea uh, to shore to be analysed. Uh, you know the the fish catch coming in, and there was a picture of someone with a GoPro, I think, on their on on their head. Um, so yeah, I mean the whole use of uh, artificial intelligence, the use of uh, you know. Uh, um, digital technology to document, you know, where fishing is happening, how fishing is happening, what fish catches are, and the social and economics of fishing. Fishermen have to take the lead in that, and, you know, and put their cards on the table and say, you know, this is who we are, you know, this is our hand, and, you know, we, you know, demand a, a stake in, in what's happening. But it's not easy. It's not easy, but I would say that um, I agree totally with Brian. And I think a, a key thing as well is this empowerment of the fishers uh, to not be the secret squirrel, as you were saying, to, to have fishers are empowered empowered also with data and they have their own data and they have their own um, um, yeah tools to, pro to prove the, their value because sometimes they are caught a bit on with within the scientists and their own that they don't have their own data um, or the the even the organization data and so on. So for us, it's a key thing to have to provide to be able to to be uh, leaders in providing also this data and and this and this proactiveness on on the issues before they instead of reactiveness to be proactive. No, and I think um, be kind of in this shed, uh, how do you say, the kind of the sharp, the sh um, like the arrow, no, that you are like pointing and, and giving direction as well to the to the decision makers as well, how to how to manage the fisheries as well. Yeah, for the fishermen need to take the lead and mm -hmm. produce the, the evidence themselves rather than sitting back and, as you say, not being proactive. Exactly. It's what's going to do take away a lot from from their knowledge and and and, and their future exactly uh, so we, we've just gone through first quarter of 2023 has there been any positives uh, or negatives so far this year for the this small scale fishers 
yeah, I mean, many things have happened, I think, in <laughs> this quarter. Um, a good thing for us, especially, is kind of this um, own initiative report from uh, the parliamentarian Clara Aguilera, that is on co-management. It was something quite expected from our, our point of view. I think if we can start having more these governance schemes and co-management in the way of work of European fisheries, it would be much better. So it's kind of a good positive outcome for so far, although it needs to be unfolded and all these, no? but I think it, it was a nice um, new that we had. Also, internally at LIVE, we are in a reflection mode and we are kind of having our board of directors and, and internally so on kind of a lot of reflection uh, on the rethinking of fisheries and how we need to move ahead and uh, promote new tools and so on. So this is a good thing that is happening. The bad thing would be kind of the uncertainty of the future and and, and that we are living no? and somehow this kind of no changes in the last 10 years and now this pack of measures, which I wouldn't say this positive or negative, it's still there and we're still trying to understand a bit how this will exactly unfold, no? because this is going to happen, I, I, I guess, with the next commission and the next parliament next year and so on. So I don't think a lot is going to change now, but I this the scenario is, is setting up. And although there, there might be positive outcomes, I think, from it, um, there's still some on uncertainties at the same time. Uh, for example, we would like to have seen more kind of explicit uh, mention of this differ differentiated approach, which it hadn't, it haven't, but maybe they have promoted different ways. Um, and they also actually, for example, mentioned the, uh, this Article 17 that needs to be uh, implement, further implemented, but they don't know, they don't say how. So we see good things there, but we still don't know exactly the the depth and the the real change that it will take on our our fishers and the fisheries in general. I think so. I would say that it's neutral, not positive or negative, but just standing by and see how it unfolds this year. Yeah, I mean, two of the elephants in the room <laughs> we haven't mentioned are the COVID pandemic and the invasion of of Ukraine. So I think, I mean, we're now living post-pandemic, but uh, who knows what's around the corner in terms of a you know, new global pandemic, which you know, still could happen. I think we're better prepared for it now. But the situation uh, that uh, has been, or the, or the crisis, if you like, perhaps better word, the crisis that has been sparked by Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine, is not going to go away any day soon. Um, you know, this situation is going to be with us for years to come. Uh, who knows? I mean, there's new global alignments going on at the moment. Um, uh, the petroleum producing countries of, of the Gulf region aligning with Moscow and, and, and Beijing uh, is, is something that's happening. So this move to energy independence uh, using non-fossil fuels, low carbon uh, sources is absolutely key. But, you know, the question is, is how do we get to this future scenario where, you know, we are, you know, carbon neutral, climate neutral, fossil fuel independence. And yeah, we see in the, the strategies of, you know, the fishers, uh, they are trying to find ways to reduce their dependence. But when a push comes to a shove, a boat still has to go out to sea. It still has to have sufficient power to get it out of trouble if it gets into, in, into trouble. And it has to have sufficient power to get itself safely home. And we don't have an alternative uh, propulsion. We don't have alternative propulsion systems available off the shelf that can provide that solution at the moment. Well, unfortunately, that's that's a big factor and 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 the energy transition for for the industry uh, is that they're relying very much so on the engine manufacturers or whoever's going to bring along the next technology. Mm -hmm. And until that technology is uh, come along and is mainstreamed, unfortunately, it's going to be very expensive for fishermen to 
to transition into a, a, another alternative fuel source or way of, of tr transport. Yeah, and I think the smaller the boat, the less versatile it is in terms of the kind of propulsion which can be used in it, particularly when you have to combine the space in the boat for whatever propulsion system you're using, along with you know the net handling, the fish storage, and you know crew accommodation. It's uh, it's very tight, and then you know match with all the the regulations on things like discard ban. You know having to carry uh, uh, the uh, over quota fish or the undersized fish home. You know the the space on the boat is becomes absolutely critical. So yeah, it's a real <laughs> juggling act. There's a lot more to it than when that than what politicians can see when they sit down and talk about it. It's when you're on the ground and you look at a boat and you think to yourself, how do I change this in order to fit all these new regulations and everything else in yeah. uh, and still remain safe? Which is yeah. which is the main thing about the, the job is we want people to return return home safely from from their work. Um, we're into 2023, as you said. Is there anything coming up for life that you, you would like to mention that people could look out for later on this year? What we have been discussing over the last uh, two years is a very innovative project that Mart has been managing along with our partners from the Slow Fish and mm -hmm. uh, the um, Global Footprint Network, which we christened mm -hmm. Food Nected which was a way of building up a close relationship between producers on the one hand and consumers on the other, a kind of community supported producer, community supported farmer, community supported uh, fisherman. Um, and uh, we've kind of come up with a you know set of criteria and a new way of looking at low impact fishing, how fishermen can um, in an ob objective manner uh, show that they are fishing in a way which is having a minimum impact on the environment and producing a fish product of a high quality. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think this is the way that we're moving forward with life is, you know, how do you define this low impact, small scale fishing? which is so crucial to support our coastal communities going forward into the future. How can you ensure that the fishermen receive a fair price for the kind of quality of product they are putting onto the market? How can consumers engage more closely with fishers to ensure that the fishermen are providing them with a product that they want to have, that they need, and, and so on. So, I mean, I think this is a very, interesting discussion that we're having and more and more it's involving not just the fishers but involving the the consumers the uh, the citizens uh, who you know want to support their their local fisher fishery yeah we in actually in the in the last assembly we we realized that besides our work on kind of the more on the on the advocacy part, no, and trying to to be the representatives of small scale fishers and the voice of small scale, and also the the building capacity part, no, and trying to make our members in the ground actors of change and so on. We needed to tackle a bit kind of the transformation of the food system, so this would be in tune with the needs of our members as well, no, and and so this is what we are trying to do to. Um, to provide a tool that we are still work in progress, <laughs> but we have tested uh, so far in three places. Um, and, you know, it's basically a tool to, to, to be able to show kind of easily the contribution of the small scale fishers in certain indicators, certain aspects, um, and certain values actually that we value. Um, and then try to set around a community uh, of uh, either restaurants, either community supported schemes and so on, consumers to support those and, you know, change a bit the food system that is now more kind of globalized and so on to more localized and 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 based on trust and based on a, a, a mutual exchange. And somehow we are looking at the issue of um, what we call participatory warranty systems. So trying to understand if that could be a solution as well. 
um, that life could provide to to also for the consumers to search this kind of product with some cards because somehow as consumers it's difficult to find it um, and differentiate it from the other fish no? and differentiate a hake that comes from one uh, source of producing and or another for example and yeah this is the type of work that we are doing um, and actually is going to have uh, a bit of work this year um, we will follow a bit the pact of fisheries and oceans measures and how this is unfolding. I mean, there's many events that will shape this year, I think. And also we are trying, trying to have an assembly um, later in the year, but we still don't have, don't have the details. But um, hopefully we will join a lot of fishers from all over uh, Europe to discuss the future ahead and maybe even um, approve this kind of um, uh, tools that we are developing in during the year. <laughs> well, it's very interesting you're discussing, talking about um, locally sourced food there. Uh, I was mm -hmm. chatting to my fishmonger uh, yesterday, Wednesday, and um, he was saying that since COVID, you know, the demand, he's, he's seen the demand for fresh fish rise, and he's heard so many people coming to uh, his fish fan and saying, oh, we used to buy fish in a supermarket. He says it doesn't taste the same now. Mm -hmm. um, he was saying like even last week, he's, Easter week, he's saying it was the busiest he has been ever. Okay. And you, you can definitely see a shift in people's attitudes towards yeah. uh, towards fish and how fresh fish is. And you will probably eventually see more people becoming more concerned with where they're uh, fish has been sourced from and looking at more locally sourced fish rather than uh, imported fish. Yeah, and hopefully trying new species and new um, or species that not new because they are there, but they are not used to it, you know, because normally the market is in five species, top of top, top species, and there's many more um, and some of them are uh, even our invasive species, and that if we can promote their consumption is even good for the the, the ecosystems and so on. So, yeah, uh, we are all in, are all in transition, and also the consumers in in their way to to eat fish. <laughs> I mean, I think two very positive things that came out of the pandemic were this um, consumer interest in getting good quality food, you know, healthy food. On the one hand and the role that small-scale fishers played in providing that. Yeah. Because uh, whilst in a, in a lot of cases vessels tied up, the small-scale guys were down okay. in the port every day, going to sea every day, bringing fish back every day, and then going around either in their own van, or we saw so many different schemes coming up, exactly. uh, direct selling schemes coming up during the pandemic of uh, sourcing food from these small suppliers and providing it uh, in a, a kind of decentralized way, providing the logistics, uh, the holding facility and so on. So, I mean, I think that is something which is quite positive coming out of the pandemic. And we know that further down the line, I mean, there has been a lot of discussion about the food system. There was the um, UN uh, uh, food summit uh, at the end of, of last year, uh, 2022. And out of that came this concept of, of blue food, which I really, uh, I, I, I hate <laughs> because, you know, it, you know, when we think of the sea, we think of perhaps seafood, but we think of fish, we think of shellfish, we think of all the different species, but now it's blue food. But, you know, what is this blue food going to be? Is it going to be some kind of industrially produced uh, analog fish, which we're going to buy in the supermarket? Or is it going to celebrate the diversity of different kinds of fishing of different species all of these unfamiliar species that Marta referred to just now I mean it's uh, I think we need to get away from blue food and celebrate seafood and, uh, <laughs> and uh, fish and shellfish and all the different varieties we have in the sea well it's been a pleasure speaking to you both and it's been very informative and I'd like to thank you again for joining me here and we'll have you back again 
and we'll have an update on what's happening out there for the low impact fishers. Thanks Sorry. to you, Oliver, and thanks to inviting both of us. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me as a first time, and I'm sure for Brian. <laughs> Yeah, it's a pleasure, Oliver. Always you ask good questions and uh, it's you know good crack uh, having a, a chat with you and perhaps next time we can do it with a pint or two of Guinness. So now if you've got this far in the podcast, please click like and subscribe to the Fishing Daily Podcast and give us your support. Thank you.